Hello everyone, welcome to this uh, next session on the uh, Crafty Online Conference. We've got the lovely Rosie Milsom here, Head of Global New Product Development for Atom, and we're going to be talking about supply line issues and how you might be able to solve those kind of things. I guess uh, we've talked a bit about it this morning with the Broomman guys. Um, there have been a lot of things that have caused disruption in the world <laughs> in the last two or three years from you know Brexit to the pandemic to you know the, the war in Ukraine and things getting stuck in the Suez Canal and the lockdown in Shanghai and there's probably some things I'm sure that I've missed somewhere um anyway it's a disruptive time and most of I'm sure many many of the distillers that are watching have had problems getting hold of one thing or another but we have a logistics champion with us <laughs> and hopefully, sorry, don't oversell you, but hopefully <laughs> Rosie will be able to give us at least some suggestions and maybe some thoughts where when the next crisis comes, you uh, might be a bit better prepared. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, know, you mentioned like Brexit, the pandemic, you know, and all of those things have knock on effects, whether it's, you know, the rising en energy prices as a part of that as well. And ultimately staff shortages across the board, um, increase in sort of cost of being able to get goods to certain places that cost gets passed on. Um, so you've got sort of like a lot of causes which are obviously really intertwined and some of them are obviously quite political as well but they will have an impact on on the economy and at, at grassroots like the smaller smaller distilleries and sort of producers are, are I think feeling a bit of the brunt of that um but I don't think it's all doom and gloom you know what where there's where there's challenges there's also opportunity so I don't think it's necessarily um yeah there's lots of bad things happening and it's really hard sometimes to be able to work that out and it can cost you a lot of money but I think coming out the other end of it there'll be opportunity to be able to do things better and actually maybe it's it's given you the sort of kick you need to be able to get other things across the line so it's it's quite I think it'll be quite an interesting thing to explore yeah, and if anyone's got any questions, please fire them in. We've got some prepared things that we're going to talk about, but anyone that's your questions, just put them in the in the chat box there, and we'll uh, we'll come to them. So we yeah. yeah, we talked a bit about the causes, the myriad of of causes. Um, let's not touch on who's to blame. <laughs> let's put that aside. Yeah. They've happened, and we have to deal with them. But what are some of the effects that you've noticed yourself, or in the industry more widely? What are the problems that people have? So um, it was something that was <laughs> close to my heart, for want of a better phrase. Um, we had a bit of an issue Christmas last year in terms of glass supply. One of the bottles we use most commonly on quite a few different lines. All of a sudden it was not available and we couldn't get any until January. Now, this is a big problem. We had to, um, in the end, it all worked out OK. Lo and behold, there were a few pallets of bottles put somewhere that someone managed to pull out and it was fine. But we went through a whole process of looking at respecking. I don't know, probably like eight different SKUs. Um, and that in itself is no easy task. You know, you've got, and it wasn't just one bottle. It was a couple of different bottles that went out as well. So we had to, essentially, I spent a week of my time in the warehouse with various other um, bottles that we knew we could potentially get, but we could only get certain volumes of those bottles. So it was working out, okay, so we put three of those existing SKUs into this bottle, but we don't have enough of that new bottle to do everything. So we had to pick and choose what we wanted to go where. So I'm sat there on the floor of the office with reels of labels, all these bottles around me, sort of, and you think eight SKUs, eight bottles, that's a lot of bottles. <laughs> so I'm sat there and I'm sending sending pictures through to my team, you know, which one looks better, which one should we go for? And at the time it was incredibly stressful because there's not, um, you know, there wasn't a, yeah, we'll just change over to that because the nature of our business is we have so many different, different products, um, which is a blessing and a curse. <laughs> um, so we had that issue and that was just glass um, and that was just one particular bottle. So, um, we went through the, the whole rigmarole of trying to find a new bottle, one that would work, one that we could get stock of delivered in the space of essentially a couple of weeks. Um, and then I sort of highlight again at this point, which I feel like I say it a lot, but it's all about working with your trusted suppliers to make sure that they understand what your wants and needs are, especially where time is, is of an issue. Um, so that's just, just glass. Um, there was also issues around cardboard. So 
there's there's a rumor going around and i'm sure there's probably an element of truth to it that you know amazon went and bought up a load of cardboard stock and now the stock market part of the stock market is floating on amazon's having bought up all this cardboard stock so that they can obviously ship all their products because amazon obviously are huge um so what that meant is that cardboard wasn't necessarily available on the same time scale as we expected it so you've got delays in terms of delivery of cardboard not only that but it ends up being more expensive because supply and demand if there's not that much there it will inevitably go up in price so you've got this this sort of you need to pick between you know something might not be available it might be available um but it's delayed or it might be available but it's then so expensive that it becomes sort of cost prohibitive um which obviously impacts things like your production timelines you might miss orders especially if things are going over overseas you know if you're trying to get stuff to um to the far east and right now we've got an issue where there's shipping containers just dotted all around the coast um around shanghai and you know i saw i saw an image of the where all the shipping containers are just zoomed out and it was it was absolutely phenomenal and this obviously is one of the things that just a small s snapshot um will affect things like that um so that's just in terms of being able to get your products to and fro i mean ecoms e-commerce as a sort of business globally has increased massively probably mainly due to the pandemic people are getting more stuff shipped to their home um so you know it's all, all sorts of things like that you know econ becomes bigger people need more boxes to be able to ship stuff so i think there's definitely but you're seeing more innovation in the way that people are shipping things as well so that's where i talk about you know in the face of adversity you know there's opportunity so i think that's it as i say it's not all doom and gloom you know um it, it makes people think about harder about how you can do things Hmm. Just going back to the, the, the thing you were saying about the glass bear, yeah. and you're sat there on the floor. I mean, the glamours of being global head of MPD, right? You've got to do what you've got to do. <laughs> I'm sure you've got a couple of flunkies to do that for you. <laughs> they, um, so you, you made this change. Did you then go back to the old bottle? Was it a temporary thing or did you keep the change? So um, in uh, in sort of 75% of the instances, we were able to go back to the original bottle. So one of the two bottles, which we ran out of, um, we were ma we actually managed to get it in in time so we didn't have to actually implement that change. So no changes were made. Mm -hmm. There were two products um, which used a different bottle, which we've only, I think we only in February or early March actually managed to get that bottle back into stock. So we've just, when we run through that stock, we'll revert back to the old bottle. It was very much like a temporary change because it was, an, a, you know, we had to do something at that moment in time mm. to keep it in stock, you know, and it not being in stock wasn't really an option for us. So um, collector's items for those ones then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> um, uh, that's, that's the question is you make a change like that and then do, you know, like, do you keep that change or not? Because I mean, you, if you're in the situation where you're at, particularly just before Christmas. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a very pressured situation. A decision needs to be made quickly, yeah. but the risk of making the wrong decision could be high as well. You know, whether that is some sort of failure, which could be, you know, the label falling off or tearing mm -hmm. more easily or yeah. uh, the bottle not being compatible with the filling machine or whatever these various things it could be. Yeah. These are these considerations that you need to make. Yeah. And then whether you keep it or you or you go back. I yeah, can't... absolutely. I mean, in, in those specific instances where and I can only talk about the, the specific examples that we went through, you know, we actually the bottle um, in terms of the second one, which we're still using, um, we already had, a, you know, that bottle was square. It can't go down the line in the same way as a round bottle can. So it already had complexity, which is why um, we weren't very precious about changing it to something that had an equal amount of complexity because we're very agile. We can we can do bits and pieces and whatever. But, you know, if you're if you're um, if your business set up in a different way where you've got one product and you're shipping loads of it globally, that's going to be a much bigger problem. I mean, you would hope in that instance, you know, you probably have enough stock holding especially if it's a bespoke bottle or something like that where you you sort of hold the hold the cards in your hand but if you're a much smaller business and same scenario you've only got one bottle it's not bespoke it's something you know that's going to be a massive change for you in terms of your brand identity for your product um so i mean it didn't affect us 
quite as badly as it could have done but I can imagine for a smaller producer where you know they're they're this is their only brand and the bottle's iconic and people recognize it as such that's going to be a massive problem for you um yeah, and unless mean, you can find something similar which we were lucky enough to do in the instance where we didn't actually need to change over um you know if it's something quite unique that's that's obviously going to have an impact down the line and then like you say you've got a decision as to like you know do you just take that hit and change back when you can or do you stay with it i mean and there's so many different sort of things coming off of that question you know in terms of complexity in terms of how much you invested in other consumables like shipping cases and stuff like that because inevitably even if the diameter of the bottle changes by like three millimeters you're probably going to need a new shipping case just to make sure the integrity of the product from a to b stays in the same stays yeah. how you want it to look you know um but yeah it's tricky <laughs> Definitely, uh, definitely, and that, like you said, if you have if you have a bespoke bottle, even even worse. But I imagine, I mean, minimum order quantities. Hopefully, you 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 you'd have that stock in. Yeah. Um. Anyway, you talk about trusted um suppliers. Yeah. yeah. And you know, this it's important for you know business relationships. Uh, important any aspect of business, but um. How do you find a trusted supplier? I mean, it's a huge question. How do you keep them? But like any just vague kind of <laughs> I mean, you don't want to give your secrets away, I know, but like just vague tips about how such a thing can be, be brought about. I mean, first um, off, don't be rude to them. I know, be polite. Be polite. <laughs> well, yeah, you don't you don't catch any flies with the vinegar, right? So yeah. <laughs> always use honey um no I mean I I think it's more about initially like you know finding uh, we've always attacked it in the way that like you know we've seen a bottle we like and then we talk to those suppliers um it's sort of very much more pull rather than um us finding a supplier and going how do you know do you have these bottles I mean there's probably like we probably work with five or six different glass suppliers um and equally each of them do things slightly differently so that's why we use various different suppliers and you know we have the flexibility to be able to do that but it's talk to them and you know find out whether you know if you like a bottle from someone else but you know you're not sure whether the other company who you prefer working with you know do something similar just talk to them open a conversation have a dialogue you know these are my wants and dreams and desires and I would say more times than not um they're relatively sort of receptive to you know helping you out and making sure that you that they're able to help you deliver on your brand in the best way they can mm. i mean that brings up another interesting point which is and of course this is there's limited ability for this depending on the size of your you know if you're very very yeah. small you know one man band kind of thing or just there's two yeah. people or something like that it's going to be much harder but um and it's this idea of um splitting suppliers mm -hmm. so not necessarily having even for one particular commodity or consumable i should say um not having the same supply for everything so like you said you've got about four or five different glass suppliers so worst case scenario hopefully if there's a problem it'll only be with one or two of them it won't be with everyone or at least not all at the same time <laughs> i know um i've heard some people advocate doing that for um botanical supplies for gin and things like that kind of using a blend of two different supplies from different sources uh i mean it kind of depends on what you want you know if there's certain things that you really want i mean if you want english coriander you've got to go to you know tommy at beacon that's where you've got to go there's not really an option for that yeah. and i can see why you would choose it. it's great yeah. but um i've heard some people say that and maybe with 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 different things as well but it's when you can have that as a scale. But I mean, does that make sense to you as a strategy to kind of 100%. redundancy, I guess you might call it, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, and also like just in terms of, you know, there's a safety net there, you know, if one person can't do it, chances are the other one or two can, um, you know, and but it's also keeping keeping them honest, you know, like you might there might be a huge price discrepancy if you use someone because you're loyal to them and you love what they do. And then all of a sudden there's a new player on the market and um, but they're half the price and the quality is as good if not better then you know i think it's important to understand you know from a business point of view you always want to be getting the highest quality at, at the most reasonable price right so it's not just about availability i think it's more about you know 
being sensible in terms of what you're spending as well um it's always worth having a few different suppliers like when in in terms of like botanical suppliers flavor houses um anything to do with consumables you know we always we will always tend even labels and stuff like that depending on how complex they are we'll generally have like a trusted preferred supplier and then we'll have other people to be able to i guess compete in terms of price or quality and stuff like that but it's always mm -hmm. worth having more than one trusted supplier for each well, I guess when you're in a pinch it's a lot easier if you've got someone's business card you've got yeah. the name you can email them you can ring them yeah you maybe you've spoken to them at an event like the craft distilling expo 6th yeah. and 7th of october 2022 in london um, <laughs> it'll be there <laughs> yeah, right. but i mean that is an opportunity to at least say hello to a variety of different people and then at least you can put a face to a name and then when you and and these things can happen for all different reasons you know if you're a supplier and you had your glass or something was coming through the Suez canal and then you know someone did that handbrake turn and it blocked up <laughs> the Suez canal that's not their fault right you know that's not their fault but they are still impacted by it and you're still impacted by it and and you still need and your clients are still saying yeah but come on where's my gin yeah. where's my rum Absolutely. uh so having potent some potential backup i think is it's probably a yeah. good thing. But fostering a couple of relationships, even if you're not really using them for very much, yeah. there's always that potential. Um, and I guess probably people yeah. are much nicer to people that are potential clients. No, absolutely okay. no i i do agree though in terms of putting a face to a name as well I, in, and that's just more like top level you know it's good to meet more people in the industry see what everyone's up to there'll always be a new player in the game and i think it's being open to that as well and just understanding that you know even if you have a trusted supplier who you've used for years and years you know it doesn't necessarily they'll be your supplier forever you know and just you don't you'd never put all your eggs in one basket sorry to keep using metaphors but you know what i mean um what about this idea of kind of having some again it's about space but some aspect of having some stockpile or some reserve or something we talked about redundancy from a relationship point of view i think that's a good thing but also yeah. just in what stock you're keeping can be easier yeah. said than done of course I mean, obviously, I, I go back to, you know, it depends what your business looks like. If you've got one product and you've got a little bit of space in your warehouse, it probably makes sense to store an extra pallet of bottles or an extra bag of corks or whatever, depending on what your run rate is. Um, I mean, even the best forecasting in the world will not protect you against the various issues we've had in the last two years. Um, or in fact, if, you know, you get a spike in sales, if you get a grocery listing, all of a sudden, you know, one of the big, big, big supermarkets want a stock delivered in two months you know that might just eat all your stock so I think I can't really give a black and white answer to that but I think it's always if you've got the space and it's not going to cost you too much then I would always advocate for storing a little bit more than you need um or maybe more than you think you'll need um on the basis that it'd be nice if you used it earlier as well plus there's economies of scale kick in in terms of orders when you go a bit higher um so there, there's there's good things and bad things obviously if you don't have the space you don't have the space and then you look at okay is it worth getting external storage somewhere but then that obviously comes at a cost um so it really does depend how your business is set up but i mean aim high you know it's it's a positive thing you know you want to be you know, get your product out there selling so if you've got more bottles to be able to put stuff into then it means you can sell more mm. and are there any other like when you're doing when you have to do these uh, this adaption this last minute change is there anything else that you've kind of noticed oh that's a pitfall you need to watch out for. we talked about you know compatibility mm. of bottles and the closures and kind of mm. the um you know kind of uh, keeping the quality of your product once you've bottled it uh which of course you discuss in your other talk mm. keeping a lid on it with Rosie Wilson which is on our YouTube channel <laughs> Um, <laughs> but yeah we talked about that but is there anything yeah. else I mean in terms of just the actual liquid in the bottle as well you know you might have a last minute change to the recipe say you can't get your specific botanical which maybe comes from Ukraine or Russia and you just can't get hold of that at the moment you know um if you do have to swap it out for something else from somewhere else um just making sure that you know those you're doing enough testing before you get out to market as well and I would hope that you know 
anyone who really cares and is passionate about their product would do this anyway but just making sure that you know the new thing is shelf stable if you're using a coloring or a flavoring or something like that just making sure that you've done enough testing to make yourself happy that the product is going to end up in the customer's hands in the way that you created it um because obviously changing something could mean that you need to change something else so just making sure you go through that rigorous tasting testing process as well um i think it's probably quite an important thing i mean generally i would say a change in botanical whilst it may have an impact um with us with, with the skilled distillers we have sort of watching i, I don't think that would necessarily be an issue but i mean it's worth especially with coloring and stuff like that where it's not something that's you know distilled per se um it's yeah things like that i think would i would be like inclined to do more testing on than you would usually do if you're doing a last minute change and you just have to get it out the door but even if it's just getting twice as many people to have a look at it or try it or leaving it out you know i don't stick know it in the window whatever you do stick <laughs> it in the fridge stick it in the sunshine whatever <laughs> yeah yeah give it a bit of a piece <laughs> yeah, well exactly. i mean it's but it's it's better that you find out the problem than your you know your retailer or your consumer i mean we used to have a um we used to do a packaging test and uh it was lovingly referred to as the rosy test for a little while where i'd basically kick a box down the stairs and if it was wet at the bottom it wasn't going out <laughs> <laughs> there you go the, the, the rosy test for everyone for their for their uh for their packaging and everything well, well I drop think it down a flight of stairs as well oh yeah yes i've seen the flight of stairs as well <laughs> <laughs> um lovely well i think that's a nice there's a nice neat sort of package of uh questions um and we'll uh this will be up online so people can have a look as well and um we look forward to seeing you in october i, think I do already, just have one more thing to add oh yeah oh, please. Yeah, please um sorry. just in terms of where i say you know it opens up the opportunity to look at new things in terms of innovation as well you know um it might be that actually you got you've wanted to do something for such a long time, but it hasn't been feasible because of cost or time or whatever. But actually, maybe the fact that you can't get something has meant that you're able to spend a little bit more time on the new innovation, whether it's to do with sustainability or um, increased presence or whatever. That allows you to then potentially have that thinking time to be able to do your innovation a bit quicker and give you that kick you need to to get it done. Um, because I think there's from my point of view, I. I've seen there is a real, real interest in sustainability, but my concern and my worry is that by um, having going through the issues we've had in terms of the supply chain, that that sustainability is maybe kicked down the road a little bit further. But it might also be a springboard for brands and producers to look at alternatives which actually tick both those boxes. So it'll be interesting to see how that changes over the next year or so. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, making the most of the opportunity. I mean, it might be something as simple as, I, think, I can't think of the brand now, but there was someone, they couldn't get hold of the wax that they wanted. Yeah. So they were like, oh, we can't wax our bottles, so we're going to have to go for a different closure uh, or different seal on the top. And then they didn't go back because they were like, well, no, we didn't have too much backlash yeah. about not having the wax. And it takes time and it takes money and there's the sustainable yeah. element and yeah, they've moved exactly. on to something else and you just think okay fair fair enough i think that's yeah. a reasonable so a nice, approach a nice bit of serendipity i think lovely might, bit of serendipity. Might <laughs> <laughs> it's cross fingers crossed well thank you everyone for watching thank you rosie as ever for giving us your time and we will see you all soon um can